Morning. Everybody doing all right? Good. Me too. I'm trying to get my um, my travel clock back on schedule. I've uh, been in Kenya for 10 days, and um, we landed at Detroit uh, Thursday, and I found a Fuddruckers, and that was the most amazing experience of my life because um, they don't have Fuddruckers in Kenya. Uh, they don't have a lot. Anyway, so I, I had a great time. Let me just kind of set a couple things out. I'm going to talk a little bit about Kenya right now, uh, but in several weeks, we're going to do an entire service based on what the, the Lord is, has shown us we need to go over there and do. Um, because I used to be, let me just be a, a confession, I used to be one of those guys that would sit in church and look at people, um, they would come and they would do the slideshow and they'd talk about people overseas, and my attitude was, yeah, it really just sucks to be them because they're there and I'm here, we can't do anything about over there. But as I've been on foreign soil and seen some things with my eyes and touched some things and smelled some things I've never smelled before, here's what I know, we can make a difference. And not only can we make a difference, we have been commanded by Jesus Christ to go to the ends of the earth. And I was, I was at the ends of the earth. Like God was like, that's it, no further. I mean, literally, you can't go any. I mean, it was unbelievable. Um, I've given our team permission that if you ask one of them, how was your vacation, they can punch you co- directly in the throat and, and they will not be fired. In fact, they'll probably get a raise because it was not a vacation. It was, it was exhausting, but I'm telling you, God moved in an incredible incredible, incredible way, and he's still moving. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, what's, what's going to happen, not only in Kenya, but in this church is going to be amazing because many of you are going to go. And many of you, uh, like comfort zone, here's comfort zone, you're over here. Way out of my comfort zone. Incredibly out of my comfort zone. I'll talk about it a little bit in the message today, but I'm telling you, what God will do in you if you, if you, if you are able to go on one of these trips is absolutely unbelievable and life-changing. So, there you go. That's, that's all I'm going to say about Kenya right now because I'm, 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 I've been hungry since I've gotten back and everything, so I really just want to get out here and go eat. Uh, if you have a Bible, let's go to Matthew chapter 5. We're in the Sermon on the Mount. And let me say this as you're turning to Matthew chapter 5. Uh, this is going to be an incredibly strong sermon. From time to time, we'll get people to call or email going, you're going to use strong language, and you're using strong language, and it makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable. Um, you're going to hate today because I'm going to use strong language because I think one of the problems is there's a lot of pansy preachers out there who won't just stand up and say what the Word of God says about marriage and divorce and sex before marriage and sex during marriage, woohoo, and all that stuff. And so we're going to go there, and it's going to get strong, and it's going to be uncomfortable, and I'm going to love it. By the way, I got to preach in Kenya last week. I don't know if the first service knew that or not. Literally, I showed up at this church, and there were 40 people there, 20 were kids, um, and they said, the the preacher was like, you the preacher, you preacher. I was like, yeah. He goes, you bring the word this morning. I was like, I don't have anything prepared. And Southern humor don't work over there at all. They didn't get it. So, uh, but I taught, I taught the entire church to say howdy, and so that was my one thing. All right, Um, let's pray, and then we're going to dive right in. Father, I thank you this morning that first of all, you allowed us to, um, you're allowing us as a church to get ready to go to another level um, in ministry, um, to go reach people in the ends of the earth, and I thank you for that. But Father, this morning, I want to pray uh, specifically this morning for, for the marriages that are, that are like barely holding on. And God, I want to pray for the marriages that are doing well, that you will use um, uh, this message and the ones for the rest of the series to take them to the next level. Help us all just to be obedient to what your word says about marriage. God, I'm so thankful that you made it so clear, your thoughts and ideas about marriage. And Father, teach us to see as you see this morning so we can do as you do. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, before uh, I became a parent, I, I, I had this vision, I had this goal of everything I was not going to be. And how I established what I was not going to be is I watched other parents. I watched my parents. I watched. And so you know how it is. Before you're a parent, you know everything there is to know about parenting. And about six months into it, you realize how clueless you are, and you're always operating on the fly. But I I said, I'm never going to do that, and I'm never going to do that. And one of the things that I said that I was never going to do is I was never going to say stupid things to my children. Because I just, that's, if you're a parent, you've done it. And I said, well, I'm just not going to do it. I'm not going to say stupid things to Karis because I don't want her to think that I'm a moron. And I'm realizing that there's nothing to prevent that. She's going to eventually discover the truth. And so we're in the living room the other night, and I did it. And I I did the thing I said I would never do. I said I would never do this, and I'm in the living room. And she's kind of inching toward all the remote controls and 
and stuff for the, for the TV, and I found out that a one-year-old, if you give them 10 seconds with your remote, can disable the entire thing, and you have to call a professional back out because like, you're like, I don't even know. So, so Karis is inching toward that, and I'm like, Karis, no, no, come back over here. And she turns and looks at me, and she takes another step toward it which I didn't teach her how to do that. I mean, for those of you like babies learn to, uh, babies have to learn to sin. No, they're born, we're born sinners. And so she takes another step and I looked at my daughter and I said, I would never do this. And I went, Karis, do you want a spin? <laughs> no, I said it. Lucretia. And Karis was like, yeah. And cause I'm yelling, I'm like, I can't believe I just asked my little girl, do you want a spanking? Every parent in this room has done it, and let's just admit, it's stupid because your kids never looked at you and said, yeah, wear me out, Dad. That's never (laughs) happened. The second dumbest thing we say is shut up before I give you something to cry about because the kid's like, huh? You know, yeah, you just did that. I said I would never say that, but I did. And the same thing that's true about parenting is the same thing that's true about marriage. I've been in ministry 19 years this year. I've been in ministry 19 years. I received Christ on May 27th, 1990. May 28th, I showed up to volunteer for Vacation Bible School. I just, that that was my beginning in ministry. And I've I've never had a couple come in and sit down for any type of premarital counseling that said this. Perry, this is my goal. Within five years, I want to blow this marriage completely apart. I want to fail. And not only do I want to fail, I want to fail miserable. What's your, I've, never had a, I've never had a couple tell me when I asked them, what is your goals for your marriage? By the way, if you're here and you're engaged and you can't answer that question, please do God and everybody else around you a favor and don't get married. I've asked a couple, what are your goals for marriage? I've never had a couple, I've never had people look at me and go, divorce. Excuse me, divorce. That's what I want. But divorce has happened. It's happened all around us. In fact, it's happened to many people in this room. And divorce is not one of those things you just wake up one day and say, think I'm going to get a divorce. It sneaks up on you. In fact, the first step is you think of it. You think about it. And then you see it. Once you begin to, once you begin to think about it, you begin to envision it in your mind. And then you say it to your spouse. It, it comes out in a conversation or it comes out in an argument. Maybe we made a mistake. And then you do it. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, God wants more for our marriages than for us to enter a marriage for three to five, some people 10, 15, 20 years, and have it end badly. God does not want marriage to go badly for anyone in this room. In fact, let's just kind of walk through some scriptures and see what Jesus said about it. Now, we're going to be all over the Bible this morning. So if you went to church and you did the Bible drill, present swords and stuff, you're going to do great. If you don't even know what that means, that's probably good. Um, Matthew 5 Verse 31, the Bible says this, and this is Jesus talking. If you've got one of those Bibles where it's in red, it's Jesus. All right, here we go. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. Now, let me just kind of unpack this really quick because back in this society, in this time period, things have really changed in the past 2,000 years. If a man wanted to divorce his wife, he could just do it. He could just write her a certificate of divorce. Didn't really have to have a reason. You know, he could make up some lame reason or whatever. But if he wanted to divorce his wife, he could just go get a divorce. Bam, it could happen. Kind of like our society today. Because I've had people say, the Bible's really outdated. Eh, Not so much. Verse 32. But I tell you, this is Jesus talking, but I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, causes her to become an adulteress. And anyone who marries the divorced woman commits adultery. Now, I, I, we're going to put this verse back up in just a second, but what I want to present to you this morning very quickly is this is not what we call the loophole verse. Because what I've discovered, especially in the Christian community, is people want a loophole to sin. And so they'll say, well, the Bible says if they cheat on me, I can get a divorce. We had somebody at the Anderson campus, this is no lie, called Jake Beatty, who's over pastoral care and outreach, and they asked this question, Jake, can I divorce my wife? And Jake said no. And then the guy asked him this question, what if I can get her to cheat on me? And Jake was like, no, you freak. I mean, and he asked permission to say that. He was like, do what? He's like, yeah, if I get her to cheat on me, the Bible says she's unfaithful, and therefore we can get a divorce. And Jake was like, no, you can't get your wife to cheat on you, idiot. You can't do that. And he said, well, what if I've already cheated on her? It's amazing. 
It's amazing. Some of you are like, what if he's here? I hope you are here. hope you just got kicked um, in the head. Anyway, I, I want you to understand that it's amazing how we look for a loophole. Jesus didn't say, let's, let's look at that verse one more time. Jesus said this, but I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness causes her to become an adulteress. Here's what Jesus is saying in this verse. Understand this. He's saying that if your wife committed, uh, if your wife was unfaithful to you, she's already an adulteress. But if you divorce her for any other reason other than marital unfaithfulness, then she's going to go out and get remarried, thus causing her to be an adulteress. Jesus did not provide a loophole in this passage. Now, let's keep reading. I want to show you this because in our Bibles, most of us who brought our Bibles here this morning, there's another section right under divorce that says oaths. And then there's some more verses, and Jesus does some more teaching. But I want you to understand, in the original manuscripts, it was not written this way. The Bible is inspired by God. The chapters and the verses are not. They were put there to help us remember things more conveniently. And Jesus, as he goes through this text, right after divorce, he begins to talk about this thing called, let your yes be yes and your no be no. And this is fascinating. Look at this. The Bible says this. This is Jesus. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath. But keep the oaths you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the, great, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black or blonde. And many of you have tried, and it just doesn't work because you have to keep paying for it, all right? This is the Bible. It's inspired. Let's go. Verse 37. Simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Jesus said, when you say yes, mean yes. And when you say no, mean no. And he says this right after he talks about not getting divorced. I ask you this morning, is that a coincidence? I think not. Jesus said that you and I should have a desire to get married and stay married no matter what. We should be willing to fight to stay married. So if you're here this morning and you're married, you're, I mean, this is, this is, it might be encouraging, it might be challenging. If you're here today and you're single, man, I got some stuff for the singles today. It's going to be a lot of fun. You're going to love it, maybe. If not, you can go to another church next week. But we're just going to have some fun, especially the single dudes. I always pick on the single dudes because I can and because you should be able to take it. And if you can't take it, you shouldn't be able to get married because your wife will run you over. And when she runs you over, your house. Anyway, so here, here we go. Uh, there's, there's three things. Whew, I'm ADD this morning. There's three things. <laughs> we've got to be able to do if we're going to do marriage God's way. First of all, number one, if you want to write this down, we need to see it. If we're going to do marriage God's way, we need to see it. We need to see it. And one, one of the things that I think we do is Christians are running around in the dark when it comes to the subject of marriage. And I learned a lesson while in Kenya that if you run around in the dark, it can be painful. People have asked me, did you work out while you were in Kenya? I did work out, but they didn't have a lot of health clubs over there. Um, treadmills and stuff like that didn't have that. Um, they wouldn't allow us to go outside and run because they said either uh, you'll get eaten by a lion or something. So that wasn't appealing to me. Uh, so, but I'm, I love to work out, and so I'm going to find a way to work out. And so we stayed in this one hotel one night, and uh, there were like four flights of steps. And I was like, I can just get up in the morning and run up and down those steps. And just, that's easy. I just get up. So I got up and put like mosquito stuff all over me. I mean, I'm like reeking of mosquitoes because I didn't want to get bit by a mosquito and get malaria or whatever. So I got outside I st and I run up these steps. Now, the steps weren't exactly lighted. They were actually dark. It was very dark, but I was like, how hard can it be to run steps in the dark? And so I made it to the top of the steps, and I'm on my way back down. Now, I walked down the steps because I'm not coordinated, so I'm walking down the steps, and there was this one little step. After you turn this thing, there was this one little step. It's probably about six inches. I didn't see it going up, but I discovered it going down. Have you ever done that thing where you step and you don't, I mean, your foot just keeps going, and you're like, Hoom. and so then I start falling down the steps. Now, I never really hit the ground, but I'm kind of, and I'm screaming um, in Kenyan, and I'm, I'm kind of freaking out and I get to the very bottom. I'm not paying attention. I'm six foot six. The stair thing is about six foot tall. And so I go right into the thing and knock it. And I get to the bottom going, I don't think I want to do this anymore. I was trying to run in the dark. And when you try to run in the dark, it can be incredibly painful. 
One of the things I think we do in the church today, unfortunately, is when it comes to the subject of marriage, Christians are running around in the dark. We don't want to see what God has to say about marriage. All we want God to do many times is to affirm our dysfunction. But God's word is very clear on the subject of marriage. One man and one woman. Let me say it again. One man and one woman. No alternatives there, okay? I want you to understand something. One man, one woman, together, forever. You remember you used to write that on your thing in the third grade? I love you, together, forever. You remember that? That's God's plan. Maybe not with your third grade sweetheart. Um, Flip over to Malachi chapter 2. If you've got your Bible, just hang a left. It's right before Matthew. Malachi chapter 2. And I just want to read what God says about the subject of marriage. Now, this is God. So I, you, you could get mad today, and probably some of you will. You'll get mad, and you, you disagree with this, and that's fine. Um, I'm just going to read what God said. And so you're going to lose the argument with God. He's bigger. His muscles are bigger than yours. All right, here we go. Verse 13. This is God. And he's kind of Malachi, if you want to read that this afternoon, it's a great book. I mean, he just kind of lowers the boom. And in verse 13 of chapter 2, this is God talking. He says this. Another thing you do, you flood the Lord's altars with tears. You weep and wail because he no longer pays attention to your offerings or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. So what's going on in this time period is people are coming to church and they're praying, they're weeping, they're raising their hands, and God isn't working, he's not moving, he's not doing anything. And so these people are like, God, why aren't you doing anything significant in my life? I want you to do something significant in my life. I want to know my purpose and my passion and what it is I'm supposed to be doing. And so they're complaining, and verse 14, verse 14 the Bible says this, you ask, why? It is because the Lord is acting as the witness between you and the wife of your youth. Because you have broken faith with her. Though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage. And that last word says what? No, no, let's do that a little bit. The last word says what? Covenant. Covenant. Jesus said marriage is a covenant not a contract. In America today, we approach marriage as a contract. And we say, if you do this for me, then I'm going to do this for you. But the moment you stop doing this, I'm going to stop doing that. And it's completely over. And God said marriage is not a contract. God called marriage a covenant. A covenant is when you and I enter to an agreement with someone and we say this, I will do X no matter what. No matter what your behavior, no matter how sick you get, no matter how poor we get, no matter how bad things get, I want you to know I am committed to this relationship. And the reason that God wants us to be that committed to marriage is that's how committed that God, through his son, Jesus Christ, is to us. When we receive Christ, God goes, I'm committed to you. No matter what, no matter if you stray away from me, I'm committed to you. No matter if things go bad, I'm committed to you. And God's going, the same commitment I have for you I want you within marriage to have that commitment to one another. Now, that's what God said. He called marriage a covenant that we're supposed to be that committed to each other. Now, let me ask you a question. What do you hate? I mean, is there something that you just absolutely hate with me? To be honest with you, it's traffic. I hate sitting in traffic. I hate being trapped in traffic. Atlanta, Clemson Boulevard, Greenville. I don't even know if Florence has traffic, but you've got a Starbucks. I'm not better. Um, I don't even know what, where the traffic I hate traffic. But while we were in Kenya, see, you've never been in a traffic jam until you've been in a traffic jam in Kenya. We were caught, we were trapped on this bus for four and a half hours with no cell phone, no XM radio. All we had, we could sing. We sang for a while. I sang the oim, a wap, a wim. I did that thing. I was trying to, hakuna matata. I was trying to, I was trying to get, you know, in the Kenya mindset. And it was driving me crazy. All of us in this room, we have things that drive us crazy. We hate them. Do you know God has some things he hates? Some of you are like, I don't, you know, God's good and he doesn't hate. Oh, no, 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 no. There's some things he hates. And in the next verse, 
he drops a very subtle hint about how he feels about divorce. Now, I don't know if you've got to get to the sermon. You read it, if you read it and just look at it, you might be able to get this because he just drops this hint. I don't know if you'll see it or not. Here we go. Um, verse 16. I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel. Did you get that? God said he hates divorce. Now, I need to, I need to clarify something here. Um, Because there's a lot of people here today, you've been divorced. I want you to understand that God did not say, I hate people that have been divorced. You see that? He did not say, because let me just kind of unpack this. Um, In some churches, a divorce is the unpardonable sin. Like you can murder somebody, but as long as you don't get, you know what I'm saying? In fact, I've heard people say, well, if you've ever been divorced, you can't serve in ministry. See, um, not really. And maybe you're here today and you're that self-righteous. I mean, you look at porn all day, but you've never been divorced, and so you think that you can still serve in ministry. I want you to understand something. We've got people on staff at this church that have been divorced. And you know what? Um, Somebody forgot to tell God he could not call them into ministry because he did. I've got friends that are pastors that have been divorced that are leading very successful ministries. And some of you will say, the Bible says you must be the husband of one wife. Actually, the Greek translation is a one-woman man. It means you can't commit polygamy. Glad you understand that now. I've had people ask me, Perry, I've been divorced. I made a mistake, or we made a mistake, or something bad happened in my past. What can God use me to do now? Anything anything he has called you to do, his calling is still on you. And if you're divorced, you're not damaged goods, he still has a plan for your life, and he does not hate you. I want you to understand that. Now, once again, if you're self-righteous, you hated that. That's awesome. Glad you, I mean, seriously. He said, I hate divorce. He said, I hate it when people get divorced. I don't like it. And then he goes on to say this, I hate divorce, says the Lord God God of Israel, and I hate a man's covering himself with violence as well as his garments, says the Lord Almighty. So guard yourselves, look at this, so guard yourselves in your spirit and do not break faith. Twice in this text he tells, and I believe he's specifically speaking to the men, he says don't break faith with the wife of your youth. And he says guard yourself. Men, one of the things that we have to do is begin to lead the marriage and one of the main ways that we lead marriage is we have to be willing to guard ourselves. We have to be willing to take thoughts captive and make them obedience to uh, make them obedient to Christ because marriage is tough. And it is tough to stay committed, especially in a world that seems to reward unfaithfulness. But I'm telling you, Scripture tells us over and over and over and over again, God's plan is one man, one woman, forever. Now, singles, let me talk to you for just a second because it's tense and I always break it up when I talk to singles. Uh, So let me just encourage you for a second, especially Christian singles. I talk to Christian singles a lot, and I say, what are you looking forward to most about getting married? Having sex. And I was too. I I was. I was. I had a guy come up to me one time and said, Perry, you're so godly. This is when I was dating Lucretia. We've been ba- dating about two years. I was like, what do you mean? He said, well, you say you and Lucretia are pure, and uh, I just bet you never, ever, ever want to have sex. I was like, let me tell you something, bro. I want to have sex right now. Not with you. <laughs> but like right now. Like right now. I, I, seriously. It's not that I'm like incredibly pure, you know what I'm saying? But I talk to singles all the time, especially single dudes. And I'm like, dude, what are you going to do the first day of your honeymoon? And they go, you know, I'm going to do the first day of my honeymoon. Um, I always act clueless. I'm like, no, what? I'm like, uh uh-huh, like that, mm mm-hmm, like I'm going to have sex. So that's all you got planned for the first day of your honeymoon? Yeah, what are you going to do the other 23 hours, 59 minutes, and 48 seconds? You need to plan that out. (laughs) Because, bro, you ain't that good. It's kind of like if you went to the airport and tried to fly an airplane, you might get it around the runway, but you're not going to take off. You know what I'm saying? Spend a couple years, you'll get to 30,000 feet, but it's not going to happen for you that day. Some of you are like, why are you saying that? Because their fathers aren't telling them. Their pastor might as well. You need to have a bigger plan than we're going to have sex. Not that needs you, I mean, seriously. Seriously. 
We need to figure that out. Some of you single guys, best pickup line that you could ever come up with for a girl is I have a job and a savings account. You say, Perry, you always say that. You know what? We're doing a single series this fall. I'm going to say it again because the Bible says, actually, listen, to, listen, single guys, if your vision for marriage is you're going to marry her and let her support you, you, you just suck as a human being. Because the Bible says that the man that does not provide for his family is worse than an unbeliever. Worse than someone who is damned to the pit of hell. That's what it says about you. Get a job. Get out of mama's basement. Let's go. Seriously. Singles, you need to view marriage as God sees it. As God sees marriage, not as we see marriage. One of the things, one of the best things you could do as a single individual is beg God to show you what his view is on marriage. I want to challenge the singles at Anderson Campus, Greenville Campus, Florence Campus. There's a marriage class. In fact, it's happening here um, in, a, in, a, in Tuesday, Tuesday night at Anderson Campus. In Greenville Campus, it's happening in several weeks, and Florence is coming. And you need to get to this marriage class. If you're engaged to be married, you need to be at this class. And I'm going to challenge you right now to get here Tuesday night, no matter what it takes. And some of you are like, but it's $25. You're going to spend more than that on your flipping flowers. One of the problems today is we work so hard on the ceremony, but don't work on the marriage. And the ceremony, let me tell you something. So, girls, something's going to go wrong. Something's going to go wrong. You're going to spend thousands of dollars on it, and then you're going to hate each other in six months if you don't learn how to view God's God marriage the way God views marriage. So you need to get your butt to the class on Tuesday night. It's $25. Yes, it is $25. There's somebody in this church that will pay for you if you can't go. And by the way, you get two books in the class, which pretty much is the $25. Shut up. All right, here we go. See it. Number two, you got to believe it. you got to believe it. Uh, uh, here's, the, here's the thing that gets me. Several, about a year, year and a half ago, I got on this kick where I was really into sweet and low, um, and I would take sweet and low, and I would put it in water, and I would put lemons in there, and I'd make, I called it Baptist lemonade because we're cheap. Um, and so, so I would make the Baptist lemonade, and sometimes I'd put equal in there. Not really a Splenda guy. Some of you are Splenda people. That's fine, uh, but I'm not the Splenda guy. And, I would, and, and this is what I would say. I started getting addicted to sweet and low. I'd put sweet and low in my coffee, and I made this statement. It tastes just like sugar. Just like sugar. And then one day I didn't have any sweet and low, and I had to put sugar in my coffee, and I made a discovery. Sweet and low doesn't taste just like sugar. Sugar is much better than the artificial, right? I've had people make cakes out of sweet and low going, I made it out of sweet and low. It's good. And you put it in your mouth, you're like, hmm, 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 hmm. You go to the bathroom, you're like, it's gross. I think one of the problems in the church today is we, we receive what is artificial into our life. We crave what is artificial rather than what is real. Because I just talked about divorce. I mean, I just talked about divorce. And there's some people here today, and here's your, here's your opinion. Yeah, but. Yeah, but. Okay, I see what it says, but I don't really believe it because I have an extenuating circumstance that God did not notice. And I promise you that no one here today has ever thought of something that God's went, oh, dang, right, yeah, my, my bad. Did you? Could you write that down? That's never happened, ever. And so I want to walk you through. There, there's, a, there's about five, and I, I listed out about 20, but there's about five things that people say when they're trying to justify divorce that shows me that they don't really believe what God said about marriage. Here we go. I'm a, the, the first one's, um, women say this a lot. Letter A, he's not a Christian. Pierre, I'm going to get divorced from my husband. Why? He's not a Christian. And I'm like, press down on that a little bit. Well, he wasn't a Christian when I got married, and she wasn't, you know, I wasn't a Christian, and he wasn't a Christian. And so we weren't truly married in God's eyes. I just, I just want you to stop, if you're a lady that's ever said that, and understand what a stupid, ridiculous statement that is. We weren't married in God's eyes, as if you did something that God didn't notice. As if you snuck one by on God. As you, God, we were married, and God's going, really? 
I didn't see, I was too busy making sure those rings got around Saturn. I didn't notice that he put a ring on your phone. I didn't know, my bad, I did not, did you see that? No, I didn't. Do you really think that you can do something on this planet that God didn't notice when the scriptures tell us that before we were, we were ever born, every day of our lives were written out? Oh my gosh! We weren't married in God's eyes. So I have women tell me he's not a Christian. I should divorce him. Now, I'm going to flip over to 1 Peter chapter 3. If you want to flip there, you can. 1 Peter chapter 3. I just want to read um, what the Bible says. Once again, we're just going straight scripture here. Here we go. Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Now, single girls, let me stop. Let me stop, because here's the single girl, and here's what you're thinking. This says I can date a non-Christian, and then I can just be Jesus for him. And as I'm being Jesus for him, he'll just see Jesus in me, and he'll come to Jesus. That's not what this passage is talking about. This passage is speaking specifically to women who were not Christians, who became a Christian, whose husbands have not become a Christian, and the Bible's telling them, Hang in there because as you continue to live for Jesus, he will see the purity and beauty and the reverence that Jesus places in you. Single girls, let me explain this to you as clearly as I know how. God has not given you permission to date a man that is not in love with Jesus. I have people say, but he believes in God. Yeah, the Bible said the demons believe in God. Congratulations, you're dating a demon. That is awesome. Way to go. Scripture says, single girls, I've had girls tell me, well, I prayed about it and God gave me permission. Okay, you dialed the wrong number. God did not give you permission. God has not given you permission to disobey his commands. He hasn't done it. The Bible, back in Malachi, the Bible says the purpose of being married, one of the purposes is to raise godly offspring. You can't raise godly children if you don't have a godly husband. It's just about impossible. So single girls, date a man in love. I don't know what some of you think, Pierre. I'm a single station and he's the last train out. Let the train go, all right? Let him go. I promise God, God, God's plan for his children is not to bless you with a fixer-upper. God's plan is to bless you with a man that would absolutely blow your mind. And if he's not pursuing your heart and if he's not, if he's not loving you and treating you and respecting you, he needs to go. The only person getting nervous right now is the guy that needs to go. Uh, verse 3, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as braided hair and the wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. Instead, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. That means if you're a woman here today, and your husband is not here for whatever reason, the Bible says that you win him over with a gentle and quiet spirit. You don't go home, take your Bible, he's sitting in the recliner in his underwear, hit him upside the head, pairs all over you today, boy. That's not the way to win him to Jesus. Now, it's easy. But the Bible says the beauty of a gentle and quiet, quiet spirit. Let's keep reading. For this is the way the holy women of the past who, used, who put their hope in God used to make themselves beautiful. They were submissive to their own husbands like Sarah who obeyed Abraham and called him her master. You are daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Some ladies here today, you fear, you're fearing what's going to happen in your marriage. Now, let me be very clear. Let me be very clear. And I'm challenging women to hang in there. The one exception that I'm going to specifically mention today, and I talk about this every time I talk about marriage, is there may be a woman here today on any of our campuses that you're currently being physically abused by your husband. Like he's physically assaulting you. And my, my encouragement to you is you need to separate from him for a time. He needs help. He needs serious help. And you say, Perry, I can't get away from him. As soon as the service is over, go to our help desk and please tell one of our security guys, my husband is beating me. And we'll take care of it from here. We'll take care of it. 
In fact, as your pastor, if you're a man that feels like, and I say this every time, if you feel like you have to hit a woman, if you feel like you have to hit somebody, call me. I would love to serve you in that way. There's a warning. I hit back. I will not stand and take, I will whip your rear end in the name of Jesus. I don't think a pastor should say that. Read Nehemiah 13. He beat the crap out of some people at the end of Nehemiah. I love that guy. Let's keep going. (laughs) Seriously, if you're a woman that's being physically abused, let us help you today. 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 If you're a dude that's doing it, seriously, let us get you some help today, bro, because there's no call for that. Well, if a woman hits a man, she puts herself in a man's shoes. No, she doesn't, you redneck. Stop it. Let her be. I don't understand her. I've had men say, I'm going to divorce her. Why? I don't understand her. (laughs) Men, listen to me. Single guys, listen, listen, I'm going to help you. (laughs) See, I don't even need to say it, do I? Do I? You will never (laughs) understand her. You say, yeah. Okay, see, I don't. And some of you are like, but why? She's a woman. The women don't get mad because you don't understand you sometimes. You walk in the room, she's crying. Why are you crying? I don't know. See, you don't understand. It's weird. Am I right? Now, here's what's so crazy about that. The next verse in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, I'm going to read this in the English Standard Version. The Bible says this, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the women as the weaker vessel. Now, women don't get mad right there. I'm not weaker. All this means is your husband can probably bench press more than you. All right? Some of you, that's an exception, and we'll talk about that later. since they are heirs with you in the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. In other words, the Bible says, husbands, even though we will probably never understand our wives, it should be our goal as men of God to continually try to understand our wife because if we're doing that, we're consistently pursuing her. And if we're consistently pursuing her, the marriage will never get old and she will always feel valued and treasured as a woman. So just because you don't understand, listen, if you don't understand her, you're really not going to understand the next one. I promise. Let her see. They are not meeting my needs. I'm going to get divorced. Why? Well, they're not meeting my needs. Oh, really? Really? See, one of the mistakes that we make when we enter into marriage is we think, all right, I'm going to marry this person and they're going to completely meet my needs. And we look at marriage as an opportunity to be served rather than an opportunity to serve. If you're here today and you're saying that your spouse is not meeting your needs, ask yourself, are you meeting their needs? I have guys tell me this all the time. She's not meeting my needs. You know, a man has needs, you know what I'm saying? Like a man has needs, and she's not meeting my needs. And I always act clueless. What are you talking about? Like my needs, you know what I'm saying? Like the need that a man has. And I'm like, have you ever asked her why she's not meeting that need? I mean, it could be a reason. I mean, it could be you. Have you ever thought about that? By the way, I, I'm, I'm just going to say this and move on. Men, if you're not having enough sex at home and you're married and you want to know why, show up next week. I'm going to walk you through the scriptures. I'm going to tell you exactly why. I'm going to give you about four or five practical steps from the Bible that you can do that if you will apply this over the next six months to a year, dang. Now, once again, I get pushback. I say, Peter, why would you, why would you encourage your church? I mean, I've literally had people going, why would you encourage the married couples in your church to have a healthy sexual relationship? Because if you have a healthy sexual relationship with each other, you're not trying to have sex with everybody else. I think that's a good thing. Holy cow, we're building children's facilities. You guys need to fill them up. Let's get what the heck. Anyway. Letter D, we're just so different. We're just so different. Well, of course you are. Because you're a man and she's a woman. Naturally, you're different. 
She gets pedicures. You don't. And if you do, you shouldn't. And that's a sin. You need to stop it. She takes baths with like smelly stuff and bubbles and candles and listens to soft music. You should not do that. If you're a man, you grunt, you snort, you spit, your snot comes out. You take, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Of course you're different. In fact, I, I, I found this. This is so interesting. Um, there was this guy, it was this teacher in a class, and he, he was trying to discover whether or not computers were male or female. Um, and so he split, split the class up, and he said, the females are on this side, and the males are on this side. And the males, you, just, you, you come up with a reason the computers are female. And he got the females said, you come up with a reason that computers are male. And so the male students said the computers are female for the four following reasons. Number one, no one but their creator understands their internal logic. Number two, the language they use to communicate to other computers is incomprehensible to everyone else. And that's true. Women can have this conversation. This is a woman's conversation. You remember, mm-hmm, and we were at the, uh, and he, and he said, mm, and mm. And the, see, that made sense. Every woman in this room is like, amen. Men are like, what? Anyway, uh, number three. Married men, you'll like this one. Even your smallest mistakes are stored in long-term memory for later retrieval. I, all I'm, re- I'm reading. I'm just reading. And number four, as soon as you make a commitment to one, you find yourself spending half your paycheck on accessories. No, and now the, the female student said that, that computers are male because, number one, they have a lot of data but are still clueless. Number two, they are supposed to help you solve your problem, but half the time they are the problem. Number three, as soon as you commit to one, you realize that if you would have waited a little longer, you could have gotten a better model. And number four, in order to get their attention, you have to turn them on. (laughs) Of course you're different. You're, listen, Lucretia and I, on the, we're completely different. Like, when we go somewhere, we travel. I'm the guy that's like, let's just take it as it comes. She's Clark Griswold, man. She's getting the brochure. She's like, okay, on this day, we can do this, we can do this. I'm like, can we relax? Of course you're different. I like stupid, dumb, funny movies. I could watch Dumb and Dumber seven times in a row and laugh. Harry, Lloyd, I could laugh all day long. Lucretia's like, you're such an idiot. She she doesn't like, she likes Anne of Green Gables or something like that. You're a dude. You're like, I like that. Repent. You're going to have a chance to give your heart to Jesus. We're, We're different. But just because we're different, that doesn't mean it needs to lead to divorce. Number E, or letter E, God wants me to be happy. God just wants me to be happy. That's a partial truth. God wants you to be happy. But when your happiness interferes with his holiness, it's wrong every time. God does want us to be happy. But when when we say God wants me to be happy and I'm going to organize my life around that principle, then we make God the servant and we become the commander. And many times following Jesus, we have to go through some trials. Some of you, you feel like your marriage is a, is a trial right now. But you've got to see marriage the way God sees it. And you've got to believe what God says about marriage. And instead of trying to get him to say, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. Number three, you've got to receive it. Until it gets inside of you, it doesn't do any good. You've got to see it. You've got to believe it. And you've got to receive it. Um, weird thing happened to me while I was in Kenya. A lot of weird things happened to me. Lots of really unique things happened to me. But one, we were in a community called Karagoto, and we were walking around looking at their water projects. It's amazing. It's amazing what that right there would do for a village in in Kenya. Um, But they have, so we're walking down this dusty road, and they have cows everywhere. Cows, bulls, just, they're walking all over the place. And so we're, we're walking down this road, and I'm walking with this guy, and he's an accountant. He said he was an accountant by trade, and, um, and so he's kind of a little dressed up, and there's these cows walking toward us, and we're, we're kind of on this side of the road, and the cows are on this side of the road. And this bull, this big bull, starts walking toward me and him. Now, I'm not, you know, I'm not really comfortable in this situation, and, and so there's a bull coming, and so I was going to do the godly thing and grab him and throw him at the bull and just run. I mean, I didn't know what to do. And this bull comes up to us, and he's kind of snorting. And my Kenyan friend takes his foot and kicked the bull in the nose. 
And I'm like, see, we don't roll like that in America because <laughs> if you kicked a bull in the nose of America, you'd be like, oh, no, you didn't. And it would just be on. But the bull went and got back in line and kept walking. And my friend looked at me and kind of did one of those numbers right there. I was like, he kicked the bull in the no- I don't know many men that, now some of you are going to raise your hand, don't, stop it. There, I don't know many men that would literally kick a bull in the nose because the bull is big and the bull's powerful and he seems overwhelming. But this guy was like, I'm not going to be intimidated by this bull. And he kicked it in the nose. Blew my mind. But as I was on the airplane coming home thinking about it, God was like, that's what you need in your church, Perry. You need some men and women willing to kick this problem that's coming at them that seems so big because some of you, you feel like your marriage is so completely overwhelming and like it's about to crush you. And God says what you need to do is through the power and the spirit of the living God, kick that problem in the nose. Because the Bible says, and we sang about this um, several weeks ago, that if you're a Christian, the same power that brought Jesus back from the dead lives inside of us. And if that's true, we are never hopeless. In the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah went and he was trying to do this great work for God and the enemy came and he was attacking. The enemy was coming after Nehemiah and his great work. And I want I want you to understand, you can go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. The first attack that the enemy ever launched was on a husband and a wife. He attacked Adam and Eve in the garden. Satan is coming after your marriage. But one of the most powerful verses on marriage in his Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 14 where Nehemiah said this, after I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them, speaking of the enemy. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, and your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. And I'm challenging this church, and I'm begging this church to be willing to stand up and fight for your marriage. Fight for it. Don't let the enemy bulldoze your marriage. Because according to Scripture, we have power over him in any problem that comes our way. Fight for your marriage. Those of you that are single... Fight for your marriage now. Beg God to give you insight into marriage and view it as more as a license than just to have sex. Fight for your marriage. Because here's the thing I've discovered, and this is where I'm going to end, and this is not going to be popular, but it's right. Two people that are passionately pursuing Jesus will not pursue divorce. Two people who are passionately pursuing Jesus will not pursue divorce. There's going to be some issues today. I mean, you're like, yeah, but, and Perry, my husband's having an affair, and he won't repent. and, and Hey, listen, you know what? Whatever your situation, I'm telling you, God is bigger than that. If you need help, If you need someone to coach you, to encourage you, to pray with you as a couple, I talked about this last week on the video, call our church, get some help, go see a counselor, meet with somebody that can encourage you, pray for you, show you God's word and what God's word says to do. But I'm just praying that the couples in this church would be willing to stand up and fight for their marriage because it's worth it. It's worth it. Pray with me. Father, today was not easy, and the reason today was not easy is because there are so many people in this room that feel like their marriage is on the last straw. God, everybody in this room knows what it's like to struggle, and everybody in this room knows what it's like to feel hopeless. But Father, I pray that today you would raise up some fighters in in this room, that we would be willing to kick the bull in the nose, God, and just to tackle this problem head on. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Let me ask you this question. How's your marriage? Are you the man that God's called you to be? Are you the woman that God's calling you to be? 
Are you flirting with the, the, the thought of divorce? Some of you here, you're like, we're not divorced, but you like you sleep in separate bedrooms and you never talk to each other and you never hang out with each other. That, that's a problem, by the way. That, that's a problem. How's your marriage? Because, man, I've begged God all week long that some fighters would emerge today. So let me walk you through this step. If, if you're married, here's a prayer I'm going to challenge you to pray. This is the action step. I'm going to challenge you to pray this all week long. I'm going to ask you to ask God this today and every day for the rest of this week. Lord, show me how to be a fighter and what I need to do to fight for my marriage. That's it. Lord, show me how to be a fighter and what I need to do to fight for my marriage. I didn't ask you to pray that God would get your spouse. This isn't about God getting them. This is about God getting you. One of the problems in marriage is we spend way too much time asking God to straighten our spouse out that we can't notice the own problems in our own lives. God, what do I need to do to be willing to fight for my marriage? That's your homework. All week long. If you're single, sometimes before this series is over, here's your, here's your assignment. Find a couple that you admire, a godly couple, husband and wife. Some of you are college students. Tell them, say, hey, come over to our apartment. We'll cook you dinner. We just want to ask you some questions about marriage. Because one of the most common mistakes is singles meet with singles and talk about marriage, and you're freaking clueless. Like you don't have a clue. So get with some people that are doing it right, that you perceive are doing it right. Call them to your apartment, offer to take them to dinner, cook them dinner, macaroni and cheese, whatever you can fix on a college budget or whatever, and ask them questions about marriage. Do this sometime before the series is over. And allow, allow people in this church that you know to prepare you for marriage. Last but not least, some of you may not be able to fight for your marriage because you don't know Jesus. And you need a relationship with him. You, you don't have the desire to fight. Maybe it's because you don't know Christ. So all over the room today, I want you to understand something. Jesus Christ died to make you right with God. And the beginning to a successful marriage is to have a successful relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. So if you're here today on whatever campus, if you're watching on the internet right now, it doesn't matter. I want you, if you want to receive Christ right now where you sit, just to ask him to come in your heart. Because the Bible says if you ask him to come into your heart, you believe that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So just pray with me right now and say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I need your forgiveness. I believe you died on the cross and you rose from the grave. And Jesus, right now, come into my life. Take complete control. Save me, Jesus. Be my Lord, my God, and my King. Show me how to live for you. Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for all that you've done. Not only that, but all that you're going to do. Amen. Amen. If you prayed today and you received Christ, whatever campus you're at, if you would, as you leave today, stop by our guest services area and let them know you received Christ. I would love to give you a Bible, help you take your next step, or go to newspring.cc and shoot us an email. We would love to know that you received Christ um, and help you take your next step. If you're on the internet right now, just let us know. Just let our campus pastor, Nick, know, hey, I pray to receive Christ. He'll share with you what you need to do um, in, in the coming days. I and mean, I'm telling you, we exist, and we want to help, help you any way we can. If you're here and you're struggling in your marriage, listen, you don't have to struggle anymore. Let us help you any way we can. We may not be able to solve the problem, but we can put you in touch with people that can help you solve the problem because God wants you to have a dynamic marriage. He doesn't want your marriage to survive. He wants it to thrive. Next week, we'll continue this series. Um, I, hope you're, I hope you plan on coming back. It's going to be a great week. I love you guys. I missed you terribly while I was in Kenya, and I've been praying for you guys. And so thank you so much. I'll see you next week.